How's it going, everyone, and welcome to the Bot Podcast, where we interview movers, shakers, and innovators and talk all things conversational user interfaces. I'm your host, Chad Oda, and today we are very fortunate to have Abhinash Tripathi, who is the co-founder and chief strategy officer at HelpShift, and they are based out of San Francisco. HelpShift helps enterprise companies deliver a superior customer service experience at a lower cost with HelpShift's AI-powered messaging platform. Abhinash also serves as an advisor at Postman and has held previous positions at Yahoo, OpenWave Systems, and Oracle. Uh, so at that, Abhinash, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Chad. Good to be here. Absolutely. Um, so I always like to ask a rather unique question before we jump into the more po- uh, chatbot and voice-related questions. Um, so since you've been in sort of the startup space, you know, for the last six years running a venture-backed company, um, I saw a quote on your Twitter that says, time is the most important non-renewable resource we have. Use it wisely. Do you have any tips for budding entrepreneurs as how they can best leverage their time, especially in a startup setting? Yeah, I think it's uh, pretty important uh, when, when you're like mid 40s like me. Um, and what you realize is that you need to work on on meaningful things. And in the Valley, there's this tendency to basically work on very short term things. And um, uh, so, you know, that whole quote captures sort of the essence of how I operate, which is to work on something that's more impactful to the society and to the world at large, and is not a short term sort of, you know, thing, right? So that's, that's really all all it means. I love it. No, I think that's, um, that's super profound, you know, especially working in a startup and, you know, just watching what your company has been able to do in the last six years, you know, I think it's, it's very much an imperative, um, especially when trying to scale a company. Um, so sort of transitioning to more chatbot related things and specifically what you guys are doing at HelpShift. Um, tell me a little bit about the customer need or market opportunity that uh, your company is addressing. Yeah, that's a very good question. I mean, so before you do anything, the, the most important question is why, right? right. Why should, why should it matter? Um, and, in a nutshell, why we're doing it is that go back to your last customer service interaction that you personally had in your life, right? And think about that experience for a moment. And what you'll basically realize is that that was probably one of the worst experiences you ever had, unless you were dealing with somebody like Amazon, yeah, uh, who makes it very frictionless, right? But customer service in general is something that doesn't you know, fuel a dopamine response in your body, it actually fuels a very negative stress response in your body. You're like, oh, I don't want to do this, but I have to, right? So universally, I think people just hate the whole experience. Um, I think the industry is kind of one of those dinosaur industries, right? The contact center um, has just not evolved in ages and hasn't taken advantage of the modern consumer's behavioral change, right? If you really think about you and I, or even my nine-year-old daughter, right? We all live by this thing called the smartphone, the five and a half inch screen, and spend most of our time uh, there, right? And if you look at some of the numbers that are coming out, um, half the waking hours um, of our lives are now spent on this device called the smartphone. And guess what? Even though it's called the phone, phone is the least used app in your, in your device. Like if you go, go to iOS and look at sort of where you spend time, there's a section in iOS to go do that, right? What you'll see is the phone app, which is the core premise behind this device, is the least used app on that device. Where you're spending most of your time is in messaging. That's how you communicate with the world, right? But contact centers have not really taken advantage of that messaging sort of experience. They're still stuck in sort of the 70s, 80s, when the contact centers originally started getting rolled out, which is all phone-based, right? Um, And we hate that experience simply because in that experience, you have to call somewhere, you have to put everything else you're doing on hold, you have to basically wait for another human to come online, right? That wait can range anywhere from five minutes to 45 minutes. In fact, there's a website called onholdwith.com 
if you go to that website, it basically aggregates all the tweets from customers that are complaining about various, you know, call centers and various customer service numbers that they've called in, you know, and you'll see that the average wait time is anywhere from 25 to 35 minutes, right? Jeez, yeah. it, takes, it takes a lot of humans to respond to a lot of humans in that model, right? And that's why companies don't want to put the human resource into solving sort of that problem. They want to, you know, optimize for cost. And that's why customers are made to wait. Whereas you look at the messaging experience, how do you message with someone, right? Think about the last iMessage interaction you've had with someone, right? You type a message, you send it off to someone. If that person really wants to, has the time to get back to you in that moment, you will see three dots animate on the screen. That basically triggers a dopamine response in your brain saying, hey, that person's around. They love me enough. They're responding to me right away. I can have a live conversation with them, right? Uh, if they're busy, they're not going to basically respond to you. You won't see the three dots animate. You'll put your phone away. You'll go back to doing whatever you were doing. You won't put your life on hold, right? And then when the other person has the ability or the time to respond to you, they will. And then you'll get notified and brought back into the messaging session. So it's a very asynchronous way of communicating, right? And that's modern sort of mobile communication. That's, if you think about everything that we use today, whether it's Slack, in the enterprise or whether it's iMessage or WhatsApp or any of those messaging paradigms you use on the consumer side, um, it's basically this whole asynchronous model. But, you know, contact centers have not evolved. And then it costs them so much money. If you really, I'm going to ask you a question now, right? I'm going to turn this around on you. Um, how much do you think it costs us as a humanity, human race, to run these contact operations every year. Like if you add the spend of all the companies providing customer service, how big is that number in, in your mind? Yeah, you know, I, I honestly cannot fathom it, but since I've sort of worked in this space a little before, I, I heard the average cost per call center call is somewhere between six to $8 a call. I don't necessarily know if that's sort of accurate of the- That's pretty accurate. And so do you think, and then, so, okay, that's, that's, that's per call. If yeah. you add all the calls up for customer service, what do you think that number is? I mean, it must be several billion dollars, you know, maybe. It, would it be tens of billions, hundreds of billions? If I had to say globally, maybe hundreds of billions of dollars. Yeah, so you're not even close. It's $1.5 really? $1. trillion. Oh, geez. Right? That's incredible. So, yeah, we spend $1.5 trillion. If you add up all the costs, right? Which yeah. is the cost of the, basically all the agents that have to answer uh, to customers. That's $1.5 trillion. That's a lot of money, humanity yeah. spending. If you really think of, about large industries that are close to that kind of spend, uh, the automobile industry, the total number of cars sold uh, in the, you know, in, on planet Earth every year is $2, $2 trillion. So $2 trillion worth of cars are sold every year. $1.5 trillion is the expense on customer service. So the why is for two reasons, right? One is that even after spending all this money, customers are getting an experience that they hate. Yeah. That needs to change. And then the second opportunity, the real big opportunity for, for companies like us is to go and change the cost economics, right? So as you rightly pointed out, six to eight dollars per call can drop down to a dollar a messaging session, right? So a messaging, because messaging is asynchronous, there is no expectation for the two people to be connected at the same time, right? you can create this fantastic user experience that's based on the modern paradigm of messaging that consumers love so much and they use it to communicate with their friends and family. The, and brands need to realize this, right? Consumers are using this channel to communicate with friends and family. If they enable a channel like that to communicate with the brand, the brand starts to look very friendly to the consumer, right? Not this intimidating thing that they have to call over the phone. So that's the big why, is that we want to improve that experience dramatically we're helping lots of big customers like Microsoft take advantage of the messaging paradigm. The, the Microsoft Office team uh, uses our technology to provide, provide this messaging-based customer service. They, <clears throat> they transitioned a lot of their um, customer service from the phone to this messaging channel using HelpShift. And then they moved the cost model from like 6 to $8 per interaction to a dollar per interaction. So it provides a lot of economic advantage to the brands as well. Okay. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I definitely see those two primary differentials, right? One of them is scalability, right? Mm-hmm. Just being able to scale, you know, in a very sort of economic uh, perspective. And then secondly, now that you're able to address maybe the, you know, depends on what the use case is, but the significant bandwidth constraint on all these very sort of, you know, similar questions that can easily be responded to by some sort of, you know, chatbot or conversational experience. Now, what you enable those people in the customer support centers to do is to actually increase the quality of service across the board, which, you know, I'm assuming, you know, you're probably looking at like NPS scores sort of increasing too, because the customers, the end customers just have a better experience, you know, and it makes complete sense to me because I've had the chance to, you know, talk to some major healthcare insurance companies and they were telling me the exact pain points you're telling me right now. It's like, hey, we already have two call centers right now. It's, you know, to scale these things out and to add more people in network, it's just not really financially viable to continue building these customer support centers. So um, makes complete sense to me. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So, you know, the reason, you know, I, I think you and I actually got in touch was because I had saw an article that you had penned you know, and I think you actually have, um, you know, a very strong position in the space. You know, I think the title was why brands like Amazon are using dumb bots for smart service. And <laughs> I think that is a, a very, very good perspective to have right now. So I wanted to sort of get your thoughts on that and why you hold that position. And also I'll give you a, a quick shout out too, because I know you have the webinar scheduled tomorrow with the Forrester analyst. So for anyone that wants to learn more, definitely uh, take a look and subscribe to that webinar tomorrow. I'll make sure to add a link uh, in the description. Thank you, Chad. So uh, great question again, right? So, um, you know, the, you know, keep aside the link baby title, which is dumb bots for smart yeah, service, yeah. but I truly mean it. So if you yeah. really think about um, the first thing that I described my earlier monologue was about just messaging. I didn't even touch on the efficiencies that bots can bring to contact centers. Simply by shifting the model from the phone to messaging, you drop the economics from $6 or $8 in interaction to a dollar, right? And then you also take the NPS scores to new heights because consumers suddenly love this sort of interaction, right? So that's what that's all I talked about. But now let's present the opportunity that bots bring to the table, right? It's another dimension of optimization on top of the messaging model, right? Um, just to give you why I'm, I feel so strongly about dumb bots, uh, to provide smart service, this whole bot hype was fueled largely by an announcement that Facebook made in 2014, right? Where they said the Facebook messenger product will have a bots platform, developers in the Valley jump on board and start building bots, right? And so this goes back to my Twitter sort of, you know, tagline, which is, yeah, a lot of people jumped in on the hype train, right? Um, And we didn't. So we were working very hard on getting messaging embedded in contact centers. That was sort of our mission. Um, We were following the bot movement, but not from a Facebook and US perspective, but we were following it more from uh, the China WeChat perspective, or I was following it more from a China WeChat perspective. Yeah. If you really think about WeChat and how they got this right and how Facebook got it wrong, right? The big difference is that WeChat started, uh, you know, providing sort of bot capability in, yeah. in 2013. They were the ones that, that sort of, you know, brought this to consumers, right? And yeah. Facebook simply tried to copy and tried to do a better job and failed, fell flat on their face, Right. Um, I would say they face bombed in a big way. Um, but WeChat, if you really think about their model, why it's worked and why it's been successful, they were able to narrow the scope of what their bots could do and make it very useful for the publishers on the WeChat platform, right? So they, ha- they released two types of bots. One is called the service bot, which basically does not do a lot of NLP. It does a little bit of intent extraction. And then based on that, you could do sort of a, a nailed up sort of flow. And that's what service bots in WeChat allowed you to do. And, and then there were broader sort of campaign bots where you could subscribe and you would get pushed sort of information. So it was built for publishers that were more like content publishers that wanted to keep people updated on sort of content updates. So they built two very narrow use cases, one for task oriented customer service problems, one for an advertiser or a publisher to send content to their 
to their subscribers, right? Or to, to people on WeChat. Now, Facebook took that and like, you know, classic Dali style, they're like, all right, let's go and boil the ocean and see if we can apply all this AI and do all this really wide, you know, no use cases, like really wide bot platform. Let's get developers on board. Let's create a fund. And then when they announce a fund, VCs announce funds. And then the whole hype train starts in the valley and you see all these companies trying to build bots on the Facebook platform. And then fast forward to 2017, Facebook's basically went up on stage at F8 and said, oh, their whole bot thing on Messenger was a disaster, didn't work. They didn't quite kind of apologize, but they kind of like accepted that it hasn't worked. And we all know that all these bot companies that got started in that era, none of them actually are probably solvent anymore, right? They haven't really solved any important problem for any, for any customer. Um, and then you look at sort of who's been really successful with bots and Amazon has been silently working away. And if you really open up the Amazon app on your mobile device and go to customer service in the mobile app, yeah. And you try to interact with that bot. It's a very narrow bot, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It says, hi, Chad, uh, there are five things I can do for you. Pick from these five, you pick one. Then it says, okay, I can do this for you next, right? It's not making you type a sentence that's unstructured that it has to figure out like a human being. Think, imagine the context, right? Try to solve that whole NLP, NLU, NLG problem where, yeah. you know, even if you talk to like, you know, people who are working deeply in the NLP, NLU, NLG field, they'll tell you that uh, we're probably very good at the NLP, uh, NLP algorithms right now. The NLU and the NLG ones are still very primitive yeah. and we haven't yeah. really figured out how to do those well, right? So then um, basically you have Amazon with this very narrow customer service bot that's more rules-based, that's working, right, at scale. You know, think of Amazon scale. I mean, I can't imagine any of the company in the world that has more scale than Amazon, right? In terms of sheer number of transactions. So that's working. And then you go and look at their competitors like Staples and all of those who partnered with IBM Watson and tried to do, you know, the wide NLP based bots and all of them have shut down their bots, right? Not one of them like Macy's. I can think of Macy's and Staples and all these other sort of old school retailers who don't really have the digital thinking the way Amazon does, right? And they just wanted to, they jumped on the hype train, right? Um, they forgot that you have to build meaningful things for customers. They jumped on the hype train, started pilots with Watson, failed miserably. Yeah. Their bots are probably not even alive anymore, right? And that's what you see across the industry. So Amazon's got it right on one side, everybody else has got it wrong. And now the industry has to hit a reset and basically get back to what's pragmatic and mm -hmm. what's really good for consumers, right? What's really good for consumers is consumers don't want to come talk to a, a virtual assistant or a bot and have a conversation the way you and I are having, right? That's not the expectation. They come to a customer service bot with a very specific problem. Hey, my password needs to be reset or I need, I need to refund. I need a refund for this product that I, uh, that I want to return right? Or where's my order? These are very narrow questions that a bot can, is very well su suited to handle, right? And, and those are things that, um, that the industry is going to reset and have to refocus. And that's why I believe this whole, you know, bot hype train has hit the wall, right? There's a reset event going on right now. And, and people are going to take, uh, you know, uh, reassess their position and go back and do what Amazon's doing, right? Amazon's doing it right. And, and the other profound uh, thing that I've been thinking about here is that Amazon, of all companies, right, actually has the most number of NLP resources in the world, right? Um, in la last count, the number of resources working on the Lex platform that powers Alexa, right, and all of these sort of echo devices that Amazon has, right, um, is more than the number of NLP engineers working at Google, right? That's crazy. So Amazon has the largest NLP, NLG, NLU research team in the world, and they chose not to deploy yeah. any of this technology in their customer service bots, right? They kept it very narrow and very focused, right? So those are things that, that everybody needs to consider. Why does the company that has the most resources in NLP, you know, go the route where 
they built very narrow customer service bots. Um, whereas you look at all the competitors, right? Stay, you know, Macy's and all of them, they went, the, they went down the deep end. They didn't even think about it carefully because they, in my opinion, they didn't think about the user very carefully. They didn't think about the contact center very carefully, right? Um, how the contact center operates. They just jumped on a hype train and that's the classic mistake that most companies make. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I want to pick apart a couple things you said that I think are really interesting. You know, first of all, sort of following what WeChat did in early 2013, because that was around the time that all of these OTT messaging platforms were taking center stage. And, you know, I think the Chinese market or the Asian markets in particular were, I think, a bit ahead of U.S. consumer markets as far as the messaging platform, platforms that were being deployed out here, because they took the approach of like this platform model from the get go. You know, so, so I think they had some, some, a couple years ahead of us and really been able to test like those native experiences out. So I think it's interesting to sort of see, you know, those, you know, implementations working very well. And then for the U.S. market, sort of having to come to this reset point, I think is rather interesting. And to sort of see that life cycle of OTT messaging platforms gaining a lot of traction and user adoption, and then what the extensibility has become, which is the sort of conversational experiences, you know, hopefully slowly, but surely getting much better. Yeah. So I think that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say that. I would say that U.S. being such a developed nation was actually its baggage. Yeah. Right? Is that we had such amazing uh, communication infrastructure, unlike most of the con countries that didn't have a communication. I come from India mm -hmm. and I'm seeing India leapfrog the U.S. in many ways. So yeah. I, was, I was in India last month and at my house in India, I had a gigabit fiber connection. And I had a, you know, a gigabit fiber internet yeah. in, my, in my apartment and the mobile networks are doing so well, right? Uh, there's leapfrogging going on because Absolutely. they don't have all this widespread right. uh, deployment that needs to be, where the investment needs to be protected, right? It's all new investment. Yeah. In the US, if you really think about how a telco thinks about deploying something, they're like, oh, we just got this legacy. We right. got to protect it, right? right. right. We, got to protect, we got to give it some more life. We got to like extract some more revenue from this platform. And that's exactly how contact centers are operating as well. If yeah. you think about contact centers, they've got sunk cost in all of this telephony infrastructure that they've basically invested in, right? And they're like, oh, we don't want to go touch that because we spent so much money. Even if it's at the cost of providing a subpar experience, yeah. consumers, they don't care. They're like, they, they want to protect their investment, right? It's all about protecting the legacy as opposed to like, hey, consumers have moved on we need to move on. We need to get on the program with consumers. We need to, we need to go follow the consumer. Uh, otherwise, this is just going to turn out to be a really bad thing at the end. They don't realize that. They're, they're all about protecting this investment, right? And that's, that's the big reason why the U.S. is so behind. And you see like China and India and Brazil and Japan sort of leapfrogging, right? They're, they're just fast. The, the adoption of all of this OTT stuff, the bots, um, I mean, there's the story that I tell about China Airlines, right? China Airlines has a bot on, on WeChat and they sell more tickets uh, on that bot than they do on their website, right? And that's crazy. Um, and in the US, you raise that to a, a vice president or somebody operating a contact center and they're like, what, really? Right? So, yeah. I mean, the US is, is very disconnected from the yeah. reality uh, in many ways. And I think in the U.S. and most parts, of the, most of the developed nations, not just the U.S., there is a tendency to protect the legacy, right? To protect the investment that's been made. And it, the net effect is you basically have completely not adopted new technology and your consumers are the ones that suffer at the end. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then the second point I wanted to touch on too is, um, you know, so I share the, the very same sentiment you have. You know, it's like there was this early you know, enamored, you know, sort of state of interest in all these like AI based bots and all these banks that adopted all these very complex implementations. And we see them now curtailing all those really complex NLP instances to these very basic bots now. And, you know, I think a really good example of that working very well is I think the only unicorn chatbot company in the space is probably Lemonade, um, yes. which Shea Winnegar had pioneered. And I think they're a billion dollar company now. And I had the opportunity to see them live in Tel Aviv um, sort of speak about why they developed the UX in such a manner. And he said, there's really two ways, it's really two high level use cases. One is, 
to optimize for conversions. And another one is to optimize for efficiency. And he said, when you optimize for conversions, you shouldn't use NLP because you know the success of steps, you're leading them down. And you know like that end thing you're trying to drive them to. Now, if they're falling off because of an edge case, there's just too many edge cases for NLP to be able to bring them back in in a meaningful way. You know, so that's why when you look at Lemonade, it is very structured, very controlled environment. But then secondly, you know, when you don't know the success of steps, you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir because this is some of the methodology you guys have. Well, I, I'm, I'm smiling yeah. because, yeah, you basically between you and I, we've covered the two very successful bot uh, deployments in the world, right? On the yeah. way outside of China. Right. Uh, so I think Amazon's doing a phenomenal job with, with whatever they're doing, right? And they keep their heads down. They're not like PRing. Yeah, yeah, Nobody yeah. even knows that their bots exist. They just, they just work, right? Yeah. And then absolutely. Lemonade, Lemonade's built a really interesting company and they've got this very narrow sort of, you know, task oriented approach. Uh, they use it for just two use cases. One yeah. is to convert a user so they can buy insurance on their website. And the second one is for the claims process. Yeah. Two very narrow use cases, two very well thought out bots where the focus has been user experience and not this wide thing that, that they're trying to solve. In fact, I was evaluating a competitor's platform this week and I was trying to configure their bots and, uh, in one part of their bot sort of intent, you know, bot builder, yeah. that thing called confusion. So yeah. In the confused state, what does the bot do? Right. right? So right. you have to program, pro program that in. If the bot is confused, what action does the bot need to take? Right. Absolutely. And we don't have any of that in the help shift platform. The help shift yeah. platform, basically we use AI to extract intent mm -hmm. from the first few messages that mm -hmm. a user communicates. Right. When you come into a brand and you say, I have a problem, you say, I have a problem with blah. All you need to do is figure out what that blah is, right? Once you've got the blah figured out, you can basically route it to a task bar right. that, is, right. that is nailed to, it, it's a guided guardrailed approach mm -hmm. basically to solve that problem blah, okay? And, and that's the approach we take. So you, you detect intent right up front and then you, and you, you route that conversation to an appropriate bot that can take actions in a very sort of guided way as opposed to competitors in this space. And you know, most of the vendors I look at where they've gone the NLP route, each step in the bot, the bot has to be programmed with extract intent from whatever the customer said, right? What are the chances that can go right versus wrong, right? The accuracy yeah. levels are so, yeah. so low. at each step of the bot, you're basically like extracting intent. Mm -hmm. Then you have to program the confusion. If there's mm -hmm. a confusion state there, what do you do, right? What yeah. does the bot respond with? And that's what you see. The general frustration online is when people interact with these bots, these automated bots, and the bot says, sorry, I can't understand you. Yeah. Sorry, I can't understand you. Right. And most of the bots that are deployed, basically, that's, that's the use case. It'll, it'll answer like two questions and then you're trying to make headway and the bot basically says, sorry, I've lost you. Do you want yeah. to talk to a human? Right? right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's so interesting because it's just like you either have to you know, go one way or the other, or, or I guess what I'm saying is, you know, it's just like, we have to create like these new expectations for users, especially in a user experience that's not well understood. Right. So if you give them an open response, you know, then, you know, it's very much likely to be prone to having issues where the bot doesn't understand. But if you give them a very prescriptive approach of, you know, here is a button based system. Um, you know, I think it can work very well, um, but I completely agree with the, your sentiment in regards to the hybrid model of like using NLP as a funnel to identify, all right, what path do we bring them down? Um, yeah. You know, so to that point, you know, I know we're talking a lot of theory right now. Um, and I know you guys have worked with some of the largest companies in the world, including I saw you guys also provide support for PUBG uh, for all the gamers that are watching. Wow. You know, so tell me about, um, you know, some specific use cases, real world um, you know, case studies where your platform has been able to drive some significant business outcomes for some of your uh, clients? Um, there's a number of our customers that are live with our AI and bots technology. We, we call it Sensei. It's the name of the platform that's integrated with, with sort of the help ship service. Um, you know, Microsoft's done incredible amount of work with, uh, with bots they don't use our bot technology, but they built their own platform called PowerLift, which does a lot of the heavy lifting. It's integrated with the HelpShift channel. And so, you know, we shipped our AI and bots technology 
you know, in 2018. And Microsoft's been using their sort of technology almost two years ago. We've been working with them for a while. And so they built out a lot of that uh, by themselves. But, you know, a lot of brands like Comcast that we work with, Xfinity, we work with the IoT division inside of Comcast called Xfinity Home. Um, and a lot of the IoT problems are very sort of technology-oriented problems. Is my camera offline? Why is it offline? So there's a series of troubleshooting steps that, that an agent needs to ask a series of questions to the consumer. So we're helping Comcast sort of roll out a, you know, a set of bots that, that make troubleshooting very automated so a human doesn't have to go ask those questions. Um, all, all that we do is if a customer comes in and says, my camera is not working, we detect that intent as a camera issue, we hand it off to a camera bot, the camera troubleshooting bot then you know, asks all the questions that are needed to get them to a place where they can, they've either localized the problem or they can get escalated to a human um, who will give them instructions and the human has not asked any of those questions. Yeah, no, that's, that's incredible, you know, and it, it's inspiring to hear, you know, so much hype on the side of bots, but actually to hear some significant business outcomes that HelpShip is uh, really helping to drive, you know, at significant scale too. So I think that's, that's really exciting stuff to hear. Um, so maybe going back to the start of all this, because I know you've been, you know, really pushing this company forward for the last six years, you know, and I, and just hearing that you're such a pragmatist, you know, what were, uh, why did you initially get interested or involved in this space in the first place? And how has it sort of evolved over time? Yeah, when we got involved in 2011, 2012 time, time frame, you know, the AI and bots hype had not even started. So when I, when I started the company, it had nothing to do with AI and bots, right? It was basically the, the vision that I talked about, you know, at the beginning of this interview, which is mostly to solve the pain in the contact center industry, right? The huge cost inefficiencies, the negative customer experience to basically solve those problems. And, and the one reason why I think we could solve that problem so well was that consumers were moving to messaging. We sort of anticipated that and built all of this sort of modern messaging oriented, oriented contact center stack, right? If you call it that way. Um, and then at, while we were solving that problem, it was becoming very clear uh, watching WeChat and what they were accomplishing uh, with bots and then sort of this whole bot cycle. Um, when 2014, when Facebook launched their bots platform, uh, there was something there and I went deeper in there, figured out that the Facebook approach was not the right approach with NLP and then made the decision that we were going to solve it in a much more pragmatic way for, co for contact centers. The advantage we had is that we had already started working with very large brands like Microsoft and Supercell, and we could really understand the problems that existed in a contact center, right? But yeah, as you look yeah. at sort of this, yeah. you know, this, these startups that were purely bought startups that didn't really have that customer base or that understanding or that learning, they didn't really have the knowledge to go solve the problem deeply, right? And we had the, the reason we could take a pragmatic approach was we had all these customers to keep us honest, right? I would just walk up to the, you know, the VP that ran customer service at Supercell and like present my idea and say, Hey, bots, what do you think? This is how I'm thinking about solving the problem. What major use cases do you want solved? So it was a very use case, pragmatic customer uh, oriented approach as opposed to like, Hey, I don't understand this industry, but you know what? I love bots and I want to build some bots. I know some technology. Let's just jump head first in and start building some bots and try to solve some problems. Right. That's very cool. Yeah. So out to that point, I'll ask you the question, you know, like as you guys begin to segue into, you know, what I guess we can define as bots, um, what were like some initial successes that sort of like, we're like, okay, I think we're on the right track here. You know, we're seeing significant, you know, whatever the KPIs you were tracking were, were looking good. What did those experiments, initial experiments look like? And, uh, and, uh, how did that eventually evolve into what you guys have now? Um, I think what we did was we watched, we waited. Yeah. There's like, if you listen to Steve Jobs sort of talk about product management, right? Sometimes he says, um, waiting and then finding the right moment to enter the market with the right product, actually yeah. the better strategy than um, to try and be early, right? Yep. So we waited 
and uh, we watched and we watched people fail, right? And we learned from that. Not doing anything is great, right? So yeah. you sit by, don't do anything, watch the market unfold. And then at the right moment, we started with uh, basically doing very simple sort of AI uh, problem solving, right? So one of the big problems in the contact center was routing to an agent, right? Based on an incoming request. Is, if it's a billing issue, I want to route this to a billing agent. If this is a account issue, I want to route this to an account agent. So contact centers are organized by skills, right? And even if you go to a phone contact center today, there's an IVR tree that you have to navigate. Press one for billing, press two for accounts. There's a reason the phone contact centers do that because they're organized that way, right? They've, they've got billing teams, they've got account teams, they've got order teams. And, and all of those agents are specialized to do those tasks, right? So the way we sort of approach this is we wanted to solve the routing problem first. So we built Sensei Predict, which is our issue classification engine, which is an NLP engine that basically is, is a supervised machine learning engine. You can give it examples of the kind of conversations uh, a customer has with the contact center, for a specific type of problem. So if it's a billing issue, you can give it examples of 100 or 500 or 10,000 billing problems. It learns and builds a model about how to classify a billing problem, right? And so then we rolled that out to customers just to solve the routing problem. We didn't even route to a bot. All it did was incoming chat, our predict model would basically say, okay, the intent of this user was a billing intent. And so we will just route it to the billing agent. Right, so that was step one. So Predict started to work really well. We got Predict rolled out uh, to many customers of ours. Predict started to work really well. We started to see accuracy in the levels of 90 plus percent oh, wow. uh, for, for issue classification. Once we solved that problem, then the next logical step was that script that the agent executes, the billing script, can we do a bot version of that, right? So then we basically shipped our bot builder that allows the contact center to put together a flow that's almost like constructing like an IVR flow, right? Ask this question, get this answer, based on this answer, do something, right? It's very sort of uh, declarative, if you will, right? It's very like programming, but then we built this nice sort of visual experience where you could drag and drop and create the whole flow. So it didn't need a programmer to do it, right? And the contact center manager could do it and they could take their script and create like this bot flow. And then we launched that. And so now our customers have Predict. Predict was originally routing to an agent. Now it can route to a bot. So um, that's pretty much the approach we've taken. It's worked really well so far. Um, and you know what? I'm not a Luddite. I'm a technologist. And I love working on cool things. Uh, and at some point, I believe NLP, NLG, and NLU will be yeah. uh, very interesting. And you can have bots that actually start to understand humans better. Yeah. But until we reach that time, uh, we're just going to be very pragmatic and help and focus really on outcomes, right? What is the outcome for the consumer? Is it a great outcome? Um, how does the experience that we provide to a brand not become a Siri kind of experience, right? So Siri is very cool. It's there on most iPhones. There's a lot of iPhones out there. But what percent of the users in the world use Siri? Very few. Why? Because when they use it for the first 10 times, um, five out of the 10 times, it didn't work. And that leaves some sort of uh, experience in your mind saying, hey, this technology is not quite there. Crazily enough, human beings want things to be perfect, right? When they use technology, they want it to work in a very sort of... Uh, deterministic manner that they know that the next time they use it, it'll work exactly the way they wanted it to work. Right. And if it does not, they abandon that technology very quickly. Right. Human consumers are some of the most discerning people. Right. And so we don't want what we're building to go the route of Siri. Right. Uh, or any of those sort of digital assistants. I mean, Alexa, I've got one at home, an echo device. I used it for a month and all I was doing was asking it to change music on Spotify. <laughs> So yeah. I turned it off. I'm like, okay, there's no other use for this, right? At this time. Yeah, I could integrate it to my IoT lock in my house and have it unlock my door. But what's the use case, right? I'm yeah. in my kitchen and I want to unlock my door. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't really find a lot of use for, for mm -hmm. Echo and for Alexa. 
uh, and Siri, I don't, I, I turn off Siri. The first thing I do on my Mac or my iPhone is turn off Siri, right? So, and most consumers do that. And we don't want that to be uh, the state of what we provide to our, to the brands, right? It needs to be something that every consumer and brand love, right? And that's what we want to build. Absolutely. No, I just have to say, you know, first of all, like I love the very pragmatic, very iterative approach, you know, to the specific use case. You know, I think a lot of people that have entered the chatbot or voice space or, you know, any permutation of that really within the past two years, you know, people are so like enamored by the technology, which we typically see in emergent technologies, right? Where it's just like everyone needs a website or everyone needs a mobile app or now everyone needs a voice skill or a chat bot. I like how you guys very pragmatically analyzed, okay, well, we can make these successive steps along this chain to the point you get to now, you know, versus just throwing NLP, NLU, you know, at the problem and expecting there to be some, you know, a good outcome. So I, I really love that. And, you know, maybe sort of segueing to my next question, I think you really, you, you sort of brought up or alluded to some of the obstacles, you know, where do you see the current obstacles sort of at a macro level you know, within this ecosystem of chatbots and voice right now that are sort of holding us back from maybe this more idealized vision that I think you and I both hold in regards to where this can actually go in the next, you know, two, three, four, five years. Yeah, I think the, the big immediate problem for the industry is that whenever there's a hype cycle, there is a trough of disillusionment that follows. Yeah. So the trough of, we're in that phase right now mm -hmm. where uh, the market's in a trough of disillusionment. While there are practical products like ours that are really helping brands succeed. Most brands have been so um, hurt by sort of going down this path and not seeing it work, right? They're basically in a trough of disillusionment. And when that happens, they don't try again for a long time. So the market will go into a phase of like lull, right? And that's dangerous. I think people just need to quickly pick themselves up and say, yeah, we tried something, it didn't work. We tried to do something very clever, didn't work. Maybe we can retrace our steps back and start to do something more pragmatic uh, and focus on outcomes more than on technology, right? The reason mm -hmm. a hype cycle gets created is that we lose sight of the outcomes and we focus too much on the technology and what the technology can provide, right? Uh, technology is just a tool, as Steve Jobs has always said, it's just a tool, right? What it solves is really what matters, right? And so um, we need to basically, uh, I think we need to basically educate the market and say, look, there's a better way. Amazon's figured it out. Um, you know, Lemonade, there's all these examples of success. What does that success look like? Show that and, and to, to the market and get them educated so they can retrace their steps back and reset and start again and start to see successful outcomes, right? Start to drive successful outcomes. That's really, I think, um, the next sort of one or two years, uh, because a lot of people are not disillusioned by what they've seen in the past three or four years. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a, a very practical approach to it all. You know, it's, it's just like, how do, we, how do we operate within the limitations of the current ecosystem and sort of position back to business outcomes versus being so hyped about, oh, NLP can do this or that. Um, so that makes, uh, that makes a whole lot of sense. Um, you know, as far as your vision, you know, um, with help shift, you know, where, where do you sort of foresee help shift going um, within this ecosystem? Like what is your vision for the company? Yeah, I think this whole market, the, the, well, we are part of the CRM industry, which is one of the largest, opportunities in software period, yeah. right? If you really think about the size of the CRM industry today, it's $40 billion and change larger than ERP. So it's the largest segment of enterprise software. And uh, by 2025, that market's going to double to about $85 billion, right? Is the largest opportunity in enterprise software. So we're in a really good place. The lot of that dollars will be spent on sort of this digital transformation to yeah. modern sort of ways in which customers engage. If you look at the old school CRM systems, they were built on some legacy channels like email and phone. If you really think about how phone, I mean, salespeople and customer service operates today, it's largely a email or a phone centric operation, right? Yeah. And as these modern consumer messaging channels pick up steam and what brands will realize is that not only are these important for consumers, these messaging channels, but um, what you couldn't do on the phone with IVR 
or with email because email really doesn't have any way to do a nice UI, right? Uh, or a conversational UI, you can actually do in, in messaging and they'll start to realize how much on efficiency gain that is. So, uh, you know, I just see that the CRM industry that we are in, a lot of that change will happen on the, on the messaging and conversational side, uh, powered by AI and bots. And maybe at some point, uh, digital assistance will become um, useful, right? Today, I mean, there's examples uh, in Vegas, for example, the Wynn Hotel uh, is deploying uh, Amazon Echoes um, in all the rooms, right? And what they want to do there is kill the phone. They want you to basically tell the assistant, hey, I need towels, right? And somebody from room service will grab a towel and bring it to you, right? So it'll trigger a skill somewhere that skill will go and tell the room service staff to bring the towel. So those, those sorts of narrow problems on the digital assistant side seem very interesting. And so that's probably where we will focus um, a little bit once that is more mature. I don't see that as yeah. a mature technology now. Um, but before that, I think there's some more opportunity and that opportunity is mostly in sort of this, uh, what I call the proactive service space. So today, if you really think about customer support, it's very sort of reactive. The yeah. customer um, has a problem, they reach out to someone and they say, I have a problem. And the other side then responds with the response. Um, but because the world is turning very digital, um, you know, everything you're doing through an app, even if you go buy a car today, the dealership will sit you down at the end of the buying process, mm -hmm. have you download the the companion app for that car and configure it so you can unlock your door or start your heater, right? And tell you how you can use that companion, right? So even my little door lock at in my house, my smart lock has a companion app through which I can unlock, right? So everything now is gonna come with this digital experience. So that's super powerful. When you have a digital experience and all the physical things in the world are connected to it, to you, right? Think of the opportunity to be proactive. If my lock's battery is running out and my app wakes up, sends me a notification saying, hey, the battery on your lock is low, go change it, right? And I don't have to call support once the lock stopped working and then say, hey, support, my lock's not working. They're like, duh, change your battery, right? Um, so this whole proactive yeah. approach is, is, you know, this digital first world that we live in where everything is so digital enables a very proactive sort of model to engage. And IoT is a big part of that, right? Yeah. Uh, everything is going to be connected. All these devices. So now in CRM, think about it. When a brand has a relationship, they have a relationship with you, the customer. Well, they're selling you a bunch of devices, right? So they need to have a relationship with you and all the devices that you own. So this whole IoT approach allows, you know, these things to be, to be part of that whole CRM ecosystem, right? And so that's, uh, those are areas where we were going to be focusing on next. Yeah, I like that a lot. I think that's a, it's a very sort of tactical approach because like when you think about current use cases with like conversational user interfaces, they're very narrow, they're very compartmentalized. But once we start seeing success in one area, it makes complete sense to begin extending that one individual use case to the entire buying process and then integrating that with the pre-existing value chain of, you know, other you know, things in the infrastructure where we can pull data from, you know, I know you were just talking about potentially having some sort of post sale experience and sort of looking at what that engagement is and then being proactive in pushing them messages um, within that experience. So that makes a lot of sense to me. And then I think the other thing you were mentioning as well is sort of building a sort of line of business messaging applications. You know, we're seeing Salesforce do it you know, with ways that sales reps can, you know, upload information into the CRM platform. So it sort of sounds like that's an area you guys are positioning as well. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, so conversational can be applied across yeah. uh, various use cases, right? We're going to stay very true to the contact customer service post sales mm -hmm. sort of market. Cause I think it's a huge opportunity yeah. uh, if not lo the largest opportunity in CRM. So that's what we're going to be squarely focused on. I think one of the things that startups forget is that focus is everything. Yeah. Uh, there are a million things to do, but if you focus, then you can create a pretty significant opportunity. And so we're going to stay focused on, uh, on the contact, the, the post sales, the customer service side, because it's such a big, you know, open sort of opportunity. Uh, there's obviously opportunities for conversational technology 
in all aspects of the customer life cycle, right? Whether it is pre-sales, the sales process, there's, there's, you know, you see all these companies like Intercom, Drift, right? Build uh, for the marketing side of the house, right? The yeah. pre-sales side of the funnel. And, you know, that's a different sort of uh, opportunity in my opinion. And so yeah. we're not going to go there. We're going to stay focused on sort of the customer service side. There's so much there in the customer service piece. Absolutely. I agree with you. Focus is uh, incredibly key. Um, so sort of transitioning, uh, you know, do you have like any best practices that you would like to share with the community in regards to could be from like a development side of things with implementation or maybe a UX perspective or just like sort of, you know, high level trends um, that you guys have seen in the last six years? Yeah, I, I think most of the brands that are out there are relying on some legacy sort of email, phone sort of technology for yeah. customer service. I would urge people that run those sorts of customer contact centers to actually start investigating the potential of doing messaging on their website, in the mobile app, and all the advantages of doing asynchronous messaging based customer service. Uh, talk to us. Obviously, we will educate you on that whole process, right? Uh, start looking at all of the AI and bot technology. Uh, more importantly, I would say self-service. Mm -hmm. Today's modern consumer doesn't have a lot of time. And the better you get at helping them serve themselves uh, as a brand, um, you're going you're to basically see a lot of like upside from there. So a lot of the companies we work with, they focus a lot on self-service and making sure the content that they provide for self-service is all really well done, very well curated, putting a lot of effort there. And the other thing that the big recommendation I'll give is that there is this sort of fool's paradise, right? In the, in, in the market right now that you can stitch together a customer experience solution with some old school legacy CRM that you have. And if you slap on some AI technology magically to it, right, you've got this, you can somehow reinvent this legacy technology and you can make it modern. And what we've seen is that doesn't work, right? The legacy technology that was built was built for its time. Its time is over. Customers need to evaluate full stack turnkey solutions like ours, right? Uh, there are a lot of companies out there that don't really have bots and AI and They've built like some cool CRM technology. They'll walk into a brand and say, hey, you know what? Buy the CRM from us. Partner with that company for your bots. Partner with that company for your AI. That's not going to work in general. Let me tell you why, hmm. right? For AI to work really well, the basis is data, right? You need lots of good data, right? Now, the advantage that vendors like us or like Salesforce, what we have is not only do we provide the channel technology through which a customer can contact and have a conversation with the brand, we also provide the system of record where all of the data mm -hmm. that, that uh, about the customer and their transactions are stored, right? Now for an AI technology to work really well, it needs to have access to that data. It needs to basically be plugged into that real time stream of consciousness or data, right? And, um, the other important thing is if you look at the AI approaches out there, no AI, the day you deploy that AI is going to be perfect, right? There's a cold start problem because you don't have enough data. Yep. Because it hasn't learned all your use cases, right? The AI gets better over time. For it to get better over time, it needs to be trained. How is it trained? When a human can actually go and turn some knobs and say, hey, AI, you made some mistakes here, learn, right? And so that feedback, that the AI engine gets uh, from, from humans is very important for the AI to evolve. So if you really look at how we've built our issue classification technology as an example, right? So as soon as a chat comes in, it is passed off to our AI engine that can label it based on a model that exists. And then it shows up in an agent dashboard sometimes if it's not handed off to a bot. And the human agent can actually see the AI labeled it as foo. Right. And is that correct? And the agent can go and correct it and say, no, 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 that labeling was wrong. And they can change it to another label and then feed that back into the AI engine. So the AI engine can learn on the fly from all of the agents in the contact center. Right. So what we did is we built a feedback loop and we crowdsource all the feedback for the AI to improve over time. Um, 
based on agent feedback from all the agents in that contact center. So that tight integration is super important. So the agent dashboard, the system of record, the channels through which customers engage and the AI all have to work in harmony for this to work really well, right? So my advice is to go seek out turnkey providers. There are several, us, Salesforce. The others are not really turnkey providers. They're more like best of breed providers, right? That haven't built the full stack. And, and that's, you know, that's a challenge to stitch something together um, and build a stack by using best of breed components. Big, big no, doesn't work. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more than you. You know, I've seen the use cases firsthand where it's just like legacy customer support platforms, you know, and they don't have the conversational data. And it's like, where do we start? You know, do we put up a live chat so we can gather some of that? But then we don't have that sort of cyclical you know, model of, you know, capturing the data, improving it, training it. I absolutely agree with that, that sentiment. Yeah, um, then, you know, so Chad, there's another one that I want to interrupt you. That's a big one that I want to actually sort of throw out there. Right. Um, so a lot of people out there talking bots, conversational AI to brands, right. And brands are like getting hit by all these sort of Valley startups, new ideas, the big question that the brands really need to ask these vendors that are hitting them up is what is the scale that you operate at, right? That your platform operates at. Let me share some numbers about help shift, right? That'll basically make this a very clear argument. So our messaging technology is now deployed on 2 billion devices worldwide, iOS, Android, all kinds of devices, right? And Every month, we see about 900 million active users on the HelpShift platform. So these are customers of our brands that we power that are hitting the HelpShift platform every month, right? Either reading some sort of knowledge-based article or sending a message through our platform, 900 million active users, right? Uh, and we power 130 million conversations every month, right? That's the scale at which we operate. A lot of these little startups that haven't really solved that scale problem. Yeah. Go to these large brands that are running these contact operations and you need to go to a contact operation for somebody like Dell. I was very fortunate to go see a Dell call center in India a few years ago, right? A large floor or a large building, 3000 people in that wow. building. And that's just one call center. And they have like 10 call centers like that around the world. Right. Yeah. So that's a lot of scale. Uh, the largest telco in India, which is Airtel, Right, mm. their contact center has forty-five thousand agents. Whoa, forty-five thousand agents. These are massive operations, yeah. right? And so, a lot of the Valley startups that are in this sort of bot AI. Hey, I build a bot widget. You know, use me. You know, they're going up to these brands. They just need to be super careful what they're getting into, right? Uh, when you go work with a brand that has forty-five thousand agents doing millions of conversations a month, that is a different ball game altogether. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. No, all, all, you know, very insightful advice. You know, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's advice that maybe a lot of people have not heard, you know, just being in the space, you know, for other people, such a short time and, you know, for stakeholders, just researching into this space, trying to identify what is going to be the best solution for their company. You know, I think your advice is, uh, very, very insightful. Um, you know, at this point, I just want to sort of give you the floor, you know, uh, let the community know where they can find you, learn more information. If you guys have any, you know, updates or things that Help Shift is announcing, um, I'll give you the floor. All right. Um, so uh, a lot of what I talked about today, there's a lot of great content. Uh, our, our, our amazing content team puts together a ton of content. Uh, so, you know, go to www.helpshift.com slash blog. Uh, the blog is uh, one, one of those places where we share a lot of insights, best practices about all of the things I talked about, lots of case studies from our customer base. Uh, you can obviously follow the Twitter handle at HelpShift, which is basically HelpShift brands sort of Twitter handle and a lot of interesting content is shared there as well. Uh, and then my personal Twitter, which is at Abinash, A-B-I-N-A-S-H, Tripathi, T-R-I-P-A-T-H-Y, one word. And I share a lot of things about customer service, contact centers, chatbots, AI, tech, right? So there's a lot of stuff I uh, share on my Twitter. So th those are sort of the resources. Um, 
I'm forgetting anything. No, I, th I think that's you got it covered. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Before I let you go, I always like to ask, you know, each of our guests this question, you know, especially operating in such an emergent space, you know, what keeps you motivated? What keeps you inspired like on a daily basis? Uh, it's just the sheer ability to see your technology get applied at scale, right? When you, when you know that the technology you built is now being used by hundreds of millions of people, very soon, probably a billion, right? We are already at 900 million monthly active users on our platform. In a, in a couple of months, we'll probably cross over to a billion. You know, there's only seven and a half billion people on this planet. And <laughs> if my technology has the ability to touch uh, a seventh of that already in a few years of operation, it just gives me uh, immense sort of joy in being able to create technology that is impactful. The, the reason so many people are using it is because it's obviously impactful, right? Because if it wasn't, it wouldn't have had such a run. Um, so yeah, so it is in, working on things that are very impactful, working on things that can address uh, a large sort of user population. Um, there's not a lot of companies that can make the claim that our technology is touched by almost a billion people every, every month, right? That's, that's a pretty uh, crazy place to be. Absolutely. I love it. Well, Abhinash, you know, incredible conversation, um, you know, great insights, you know, we'll definitely have you come back on again, you know, when you guys have some more updates that you would like to share and very much appreciate uh, you being a guest on the podcast today. Well, thanks for having me here and great questions. Thank you, Chad. Absolutely. Take care. Bye. We'll